Good morning, welcome. How's everybody doing this morning? Yeah? Bienvenidos, buenos dias. Um, it is such a pleasure to um, welcome you here today to our documented Champions of Change. So thank you so much for our champs that have come from so far away to be with us uh, today at the White House. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce a very special guest, um, a real champion of change for our education. It is with honor that we welcome United States Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan. Well, good morning. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, every, every chance we have, we try and celebrate amazing teachers. Nothing is harder. Nothing might cause you to shed more tears at times, but nothing is more important. And we have amazing, amazing kids all over the country. And we just need more teachers, more adults stepping up to give them a chance in life. And I can't tell you how many kids I've met as I travel the country who talk about that teacher, or that counselor, or that social worker, who co or that coach who saw something in them that they didn't see in themselves and helped them become something that they hadn't even imagined. And so as hard as it is, as difficult as it is, as challenging as it is, there's just no better place in the world to have an impact than the classroom. And all of you who we're, re who we're recognizing today have overcome some real challenges. And that grit and that resilience and that perseverance, that's exactly what we're trying to teach our kids. And we can talk about it, we can lecture from places like this, or we can simply live it. And you guys have lived it in a really profound way. So I say all the time, our teachers are nation builders. Um, you guys are helping to make our nation stronger. Um, our nation still has a ways to go to fully embrace our immigrant community. We need you to challenge us and challenge all of us as leaders to continue to do the right thing. And we still have a heck of a long way to go. We've made some progress, but not nearly as much as myself or many of us in this room or the president would have liked. But that doesn't mean we stop or we slow down or we get frustrated, we throw our hands up. We keep pushing, we keep working. And the example of leadership that you guys are, are uh, demonstrating for all of us, your ability to be a role model, your ability to be a mentor is, is really, really profound. So on a very personal level, thank you for the example you set every, every single day, and thank you for the difference you're making in our students' lives. Um, now it's my honor to uh, bring up our, uh, our documented uh, Champions of Change, and uh, when they come up, please give them a huge round of applause. Let me start with Jamie Ballesteros. Jamie, please come up. <laughs> Jamie. Jamie's pursuing his master's degree in urban education at Loyola Marymount University while working as a high school chemistry teacher um, at a public charter school in the heart of the Watts neighborhood in LA. Please give him another round of applause. Uh, Maria Dominguez, please come up. Please give Maria a round of applause. Maria is a first grade bilingual teacher in Austin, Texas, and as a union leader, she's helped to lead citizenship drives and educational forums and DACA clinics in conjunction with United We Dream. So please give her another round of applause. <laughs> Yara Eldago, please come up. Please give Yara a good round of applause. She works at Sacred Heart uh, Nativity Schools in San Jose, California. She's a middle school math and science teacher. Please give her another round of applause. <laughs> Kasifa Islam, please come up. Kasifa. <laughs> Kasifa uh, works as a pre-K teacher, and we're obviously trying to do a lot more early childhood education. She's passionate about closing the achievement gap in the Houston area, and the Houston schools are doing some fantastic things. Thanks so much for your leadership. Uh, Luis Enrique Juarez, please come up. Luis, come up. Lu Luis is a fifth grade math and science bi bilingual teacher at William Liscomb Elementary School in Dallas, and Dallas is doing fantastic work. Please give him another round of applause. Marissa Molina, please come up. Please, please give Marissa a big round of applause. She teaches Spanish for native speakers at the Denver School of Science and Technology, the high school there. And again, Denver is another district that's really on the rise. Please give her another round of applause. Uh, Dinora Flores Perez, please come up. Dinora. The 
Nora is an elementary uh, teacher in Navajo, New Mexico, and is, like all of you, is working to really try and empower low-income communities. Please, please give her another round of applause. Uh, David Leando Uri, uh, sorry, Uriona, please, David, please come up. Dave and I met a couple years ago. It's great to see him again, and he's working at High Tech Early College in Denver, Colorado. We've got a big Denver contingent here. <laughs> and our ninth uh, champion of change, Rosario Del Carmen Quiroz Villarreal, please come up. <laughs> Rosario is a fourth grade bilingual teacher at Alvarez Elementary School in McAllen uh, Independent School District. Please give all of our docu documented champions of change a huge round of applause. We always talk about not talking about our values, but living our values. These are, these are great young teachers living their values every single day. Thank you so much, Secretary Duncan, and thank you to all of our champs who looked fabulous up on stage. Let's give them one more round of applause. As I mentioned early, earlier, my name is Catherine Gologli, and I run the Champions of Change program here at the White House, and we could not be more thrilled to have such an exciting and excited group of young people in the room today. Um, and so to not just our champions, but to all the teachers and educators here in the room, um, one, I want to give you all a round of applause, too. So it's fun to hear from some of our senior administration officials. They have a lot to say. They are very excited about the work you all are doing. But my favorite part of the Champions of Change program is hearing from the champions themselves about their experiences. And so I'm very pleased uh, to welcome to the stage our first panel and our moderator, Elisa Villanueva Beard, the co-CEO of Teach for America. So panel, come on up. Elisa, who's our moderator, uh, grew up in the Rio Grande Valley in, of South Texas and started with TFA 15 years ago in Phoenix, where she taught first and second day grade bilingual education as a 1998 core member. Elisa joined TFA's staff in uh, 2001 and has been, has been co-CEO since 2013. As a Me Mexican-American, she's been a champion for teachers with DACA status, and we are pleased that she can join us here today. Elisa is going to lead us in a dis uh, our champs in a in a discussion of the pathways that they have taken um, to becoming documented teachers. So thank you all, and I'll turn it over to Elisa. Great. Good morning, everybody. Um, this is extraordinary to be here uh, today. Hopefully, everyone is truly taken in the moment. Um, it, it feels like a, a, a truly momentous time, at least for me. And um, just a bit about Teach for America, uh, for those of you that are not familiar. Um, I Teach for America, basically, the folks that join um, our organization have decided to stand up and say, it is not right that in our country, where you are born is the biggest determinant of the life outcomes um, that you have access to and the opportunities that you have um, in your life. And we basically believe, as I think most Americans, that 
that should not it, that should not matter. Um, every kid, no matter where you're born, no matter your skin color, no matter your um, immigration status, should have access to an excellent and equitable education. And the folks that join us choose to act on that. Um, the problem of educational equity um, inequity is massive and it's complex. We've learned there's no silver bullet. The good news about this is that we also know that it's solvable. Um, we've been at this. There's lots of progress. Um, you watch incredible teachers be able to produce amazing results. We have whole schools in urban and rural America today, hundreds of them that are showing us that kids growing up in low-income communities, kids of color, can perform as their more affluent peers. And that creates an imperative for us. Um, our response to that at Teach for America is to say, as we've learned in history, in our country and in the world, when there is a massive problem that has to get solved, one of the most important things that you have to do is get your very best people obsessed about it and determined to solve it. Um, so at TFA, we seek out to enlist the most talented, you know, incredible talent this country has to offer. And we say, join us to be a leader in the classroom. Um, and it's a two-year commitment, but it's way more than a two-year commitment. It's, it's all about the two years and ensuring that we deliver a great education for our children because our kids deserve the very best, but it's also about every year after that and fully contributing, um, both working within education and classrooms as school leaders, as system leaders, but then also outside of the classrooms. We need, we need policy changes. We need people taking on the issues of health care and the juvenile, juvenile justice systems, economic development, et cetera, and it's going to take true systemic change to change this, and we respond um, through leadership. Um, so it is an honor to be here because at the end of the day, the front lines, and the very front lines of the front lines is our teachers. Um, so congratulations to all nine of you and all the educators in the room because um, you all know this work is just incredibly difficult. Um, it's challenging, but it is powerful um, to, to be a leader in the classroom as well. Um, so we are going to um, jump right in, and I will say one thing that I am sort of overwhelmed by, the reason I keep, you know, this, this feeling is, um, it's sort of surreal for me at Teach for America. Two years ago, we had two um, documented teachers, and today at TFA, we have over 100 documented teachers, which um, <laughs> Yeah, so um, just thanks to all of you for, for raising your hand and, and being part of change. Um, you all are changing truly one classroom at a time in our nation and making our nation strong. Um, and thank you so much to Secretary Duncan and his team for knowing that this is something worth celebrating, validating this, and understanding the power that you all have in the classroom. So um, with that said, we are going to hear from these amazing individuals today. Um, so I'd like to welcome you all. Um, and. We thought, um, I thought the best way to start is obviously to just hear a little bit about who you are. We heard briefly, um, but why don't we focus on you all telling us, you know, in one to ten, two minutes, just so we get warmed up here, um, where you're from, um, where you live, where, what you teach um, today, um, so that we can just start to remember who you are, and then we'll, we'll dig in. Do you want to start, Rosario? Hi, I'm Rosario Quiroz. I am originally from Mexico. I grew up in Hendersonville, North Carolina, and currently I'm teaching a fourth grade bilingual education in McAllen, Texas, right on the border, uh, which uh, Elisa was sharing that she uh, attended that school, so that's exciting. She teaches at the elementary school I went to. <laughs> I'm like, you know my neighborhood in the Rio Grande Valley. It's amazing. My name is Jamie Ballesteros. I was born in the Philippines and I moved to the United States with my family when I was 11. I grew up in Jersey City, New Jersey, and after college I decided to join Teach for America. So now I'm currently teaching in Los Angeles. I'm teaching 11th grade chemistry in Watts. Hmm. My name is Marissa Molina. I'm originally from Chihuahua, Mexico, and I've lived in Colorado for now almost 15 years. And I have the pleasure of teaching in Denver at a school called the Denver School of Science and Technology, and I teach Spanish for native speakers. Good morning. Buenos dias. Uh, my name is uh, Luis Juarez. I am originally from small town Cadereyta Jimenez in Nuevo León. 
uh, Mexico. I currently live in Dallas, Texas. I went to uh, school for four years in 2010 when I graduated from high school at uh, UT Austin. Hook him horns. <laughs> and uh, I, I currently teach at William Lifscomb Elementary School in Old East Dallas, Texas. And I teach uh, bilingual math and science in fifth grade. Awesome. Um, so, you know, it's no secret that in our country today, it's not easy to get, you know, some of our most talented folks to raise their hand and say, I want to be a teacher. Um, the pressures of teaching, the context has just changed so much, um, yet the power of a teacher is incredible. Why don't you all tell us a little bit about why, why did you choose to teach and why do you choose to get up every day and, and be fully committed to this? Maybe we'll start with you, Luis. With me? Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, uh, really, uh, this passion came from previous teachers. I moved to the States when I was 13, and I went straight into seventh grade. And, you know, that's an age where it's kind of harder to first pick up the language, right? Pick up the language. Um, I came here knowing no English. And um, teachers truly took the time to care for me, and not only academically, but also, you know, my personal life. And that is truly, for me, what, what made it. And um, just simple things as, you know, Miss Fowler staying after school with me, you know, to talk to me so I could practice my English because from the book it wasn't the only way, you know, that I was going to learn the English. The, the English. Or, you know, Miss Guerra, ninth grade, um, senior year in high school, they pushed me to be the, you know, the MC of my high school senior class. And I'm here, you know, um, shaking because. Mm. It was something that was the first thing that, you know, a teacher did for me that made me really, you know, realize that they care for you. Mm. And I just, I just saw firsthand the power that that has on the student, and it truly motivated me. And I made it a mission, you know, to do that for other kids, too. And thankfully, I can say that I've done it. I've finished my first year, and I had such, you know, positive uh, experiences in the classroom not only with the students, but their parents. Hmm. Yeah. Going off of what Luis is saying, it's absolutely those educators that have impacted our lives. I know that um, they, they just play such a huge role. Um, I always, like you, was surrounded by teachers who truly believed in me, and they showed it by going above and beyond. Um, and when I was in high school, my guidance counselor, never having dealt with the situation of an undocumented student, told me, you know what, we're going to figure it out. We're going to get you to college. And even beyond the teachers, uh, all of the people who've made the most tremendous impact have had a background in education. My executive director at the Boys and Girls Club, amazing too, uh, truly helped me develop uh, some skills that I didn't know I had. Um, I remember growing up, I always struggled the most with writing. Um, but he told me that I could get the skills that I needed. And now I'm teaching fourth grade, teaching uh, children to, <laughs> to write. Um, mm. And I've also been working with the boys. And, I started working with the Boys and Girls Club when I was 15 years old. So I realized then that um, I truly loved working with children. I think that um, the work is incredibly rewarding and transformative. I know uh, we all have our students and we see how um, they learn so quickly. They're sponges and they, it's exciting to watch them grow and develop. Um, and it's transformative because they are incredibly honest. So you know right away where you need to change. Um, I've grown so much and developed and uh, continue changing my practices based on what I see from them, what they're reflecting back to me. And I really, truly feel that I need my students as much as they need me. Mm. What you all are saying about um, your former teachers really resonates with me as well. Um, when I was graduating college, I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do after college, but in thinking back to my own educational experiences, I told myself that 
hey, you're graduating college in a few months because of the teachers who put you here. So going through high school as an undocumented student, I was never sure whether I was able to go to college um, until I told Ms. Solberg, my junior um, year English teacher, that I was undocumented. She didn't quite know how she was um, going to get me to college, but she told me that we're going to do research together. Um, and that really inspired me to have the same impact on others. So for me, standing in front of the classroom, in front of my students, I feel it's very powerful for me to tell my story because it would have made things 10 times better mm -hmm. just to have another undocumented teacher who was able to graduate college and be in the classroom. I think for me, there's like one experience that I remember very clearly. That was the, the day I, I decided that I needed to be in education and I didn't know I could be a teacher then. Um, but I worked for admissions at the college where I, that I attended in Colorado and uh, a dad called the office and he didn't speak English and so uh, I was the only one who could speak Spanish so I talked to him and he said, you know, I don't know why my son got denied and, and I don't understand how to get him to college, I just know I want him to go to school. Um, and I said, well, well, do you know what, what his ACT score was? And he said, I don't know what the ACT is. And so I explained to him what an ACT was. I explained to him what a GPA was. And I talked to him about um, this index scorecard that Colorado uses um, to place students. And he said, well, can you help me talk to him? So I had a conversation um, with his son and we talked about his opportunity to go to community college and kind of fix some of his grades to be able to go to college. And, and I realized, that not that long ago I was in that position. I didn't know what was next for me, but there was somebody much like everyone else in this table right now who said, I'm gonna help you and we're not gonna give up on you. Um, and that was my high school counselor, Mr. Leffler. And he sat with me and he explained things to me and we made phone calls together. And I think the most important part of that was I knew I wasn't alone and I had somebody who was fighting this battle with me. Um, so I said, you know, I want there to be more people like Mr. Leffler, and I need to pay it forward. And it wasn't just about me at that moment, it was about all the other students like me who need someone by their side who believes in them. Um, and I researched Teach for America, and I was like, oh, people like me probably can't get in here. And I kept scrolling down the website because my school um, doesn't have a Teach for America presence, and so I kept scrolling down um, and I was like, oh, they're accepting documented teachers. Like, this is really exciting. And I Googled it and I l read more. And I read some about um, a statement that Teach for America had made about why they were deciding to bring documented teachers to the classroom. And I said, I want to be a part of that. Um, and I didn't know what I was getting myself into. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I found some really amazing people. I, I feel like I am truly lucky to, to have met um, one of the first DACA teachers in Colorado who continues to inspire me every day. And so it's, it's for those people, um, it's for my community and for all the kids that, that really deserve somebody who believes in them. Um, you all are such an inspiration. You know, in just listening to you all and those of us that work in the system, um, you all have clearly been really successful um, so far in our learning, and there's a lot to learn, and you'll be learning forever. Um, the more I learn, the more I know I don't understand. Um, can you, and the more questions I have. Um, I'm curious from your own perspective, um, given your personal experiences, but then also your, your time in the classroom, um, what do you see as the greatest challenge or challenge set of challenges that we have to take on that is just good to illuminate um, as we grapple with solutions and as we grapple with how to you know make the greatest impact in this work. You want to start? I'll start again. Go. You know, at the beginning, my kids thought I lived in a classroom. Um, <laughs> really, uh, especially as a first year. As a first year teaching, the first year is the hardest year as a teacher um, because you come with nothing. You know, you're sitting at home the day before school starts and you're like, what am I gonna do tomorrow? As much as you plan it, it never goes the way you plan it. Um, and the next day, 19 kids come to you 
two classes of 19 kids each, 38. And you have to, they come from different walks of life, different experience, each one of them with their own different personality. And you have to cater to each one of those students, all of them. No matter if they give you the hardest day of your life, you know, mm -hmm. you are probably the most, uh, you're probably what they look forward to whenever they go home. Um, you, you, you don't know what the students are going you know, through. And uh, that was, was one of the most challenging things. You know, how can I cater to my students because you know, I'm there for them? And you just have to find ways you know, aside from, you know, the homework they turn in or that they don't. <laughs> um, there's always reasons behind, be, you know, behind why they act the way they do in the classroom. And you really have to get to know, you know, those, those reasons. And, um, you know, some of the things that I do is I, I shop around where they shop. You know, I go to uh, mm -hmm. Supermercado Mexico or, you know, Malone's or I run around the neighborhood and they see me. They see me in the classroom, uh, outside of the classroom. And, you know, sometimes they just stop to chat with them. Yeah, that sometimes they just need to listen to, you know, they need someone to listen to them outside of the classroom. And uh, that was one of the most challenging things, you know, just finding the right balance and, you know, given them what they really need. Yeah, I think just going off what Luis said, I think that community aspect of teaching is so important. And I think sometimes we walk into a school saying like, I am going to like make you better. I'm going to get you to college. But it's, it's not about what you're going to do to this community you're going into. It's what you can do with them and, and how you can be a part of that community. And I think like, it can be challenging because you're still you still have so much to learn and yet at the same time like you want to be a part of what they're doing and so like simple things like shopping at the same place they shop at and they get so excited to see you um i go to church where they go to church and and um, i've taken my parents to church with me there too and so when they see that i'm making this effort that i'm not there just just to leave in two years and i am truly wanting to to get to know them and their families, it matters to them. And they become invested not only in me, but in their education. And I think that's so important. And, and um, that compassion that you approach your students with is, is also really important. I think a lot of us here work in communities where our students don't necessarily have all the resources that they need. So when we talk about the achievement gap, a lot of that stems from a gap in the resources that are not in the classroom. So as a chemistry teacher, I really strive for my students to be able to walk into, you know, their first chemistry class in college knowing what a beaker is, knowing what a beaker is or knowing what an Erlenmeyer flask is. So it's hard when we don't have those things in the classroom and it's hard when I can't provide my students with um, labs sometimes. So um, as a teacher, I'm really learning how to be innovative and how to be really resourceful. So a lot of these labs come from my kitchen or they come from the grocery store, but we make it work because as teachers, we really need to be able to provide our students with what we can. I agree with Jaime. I think that one of the biggest challenges I've faced has been a lack of resources. Um, especially with the first year teaching, we're learning so much as we're going and when you have to make your own resources on top of that, sometimes there just isn't enough time. That's another challenge, but I don't know what we can do about not having enough hours in a day <laughs> to provide the individualized support that our students need. Um, and when, when I talk about resources, I also mean you know in terms of personnel. Sometimes as new teachers, we really need mentorship. And I feel incredibly fortunate um, to have worked with uh, the team that I had this past year, but I feel like it shouldn't be left up to fortune or luck whether we have the resources we need to, um, to have the mentors that are going to guide us and in, into you know, better practices and doing the best we can for our, our students. Great insight. Um, you know, one of the things that Teach for America that we believe, and it's one of our values, 
is that it's incredibly important for us to recruit a very diverse set of folks um, into the core, um, folks that share the background of our kids and folks that don't, um, because we believe having just a diverse you know, group of people with various walks of life is incredibly important. At the same time, we always say that we believe that there is um, a profound additional impact that folks can make who do share the background of our kids and have the potential to make. We know all teachers can be successful no matter your background, um, but there's, this, there's some, this important acknowledgement that there is a potential to have a different and profound impact when you do share um, the background with um, your kids. And you all um, have the opportunity to have this sort of impact, and so I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about do do you see a difference between you know you as a first year teacher as a documented teacher teaching your kids other first year teachers any anything that's distinguishing that is worth um saying out loud that helps folks who are listening and and going to be watching this understand just um the potential of impact um, when you are sit in, in shoes like yours um, and have the power to lead and facilitate a classroom of young people Just recently, I, I had a really profound experience about a week ago. Um, I went to the quinceanera rehearsal of one of my students, um, and she was the one student who always came to my classroom in the morning to say good morning, just to shake my hand and leave right before she'd be late to class. Uh, and she did this every single day, and, and I went to, to make sure that I was there for her. And as I was leaving, her mom approached me, and she, her eyes started tearing up, and, and she said to me, you know, I want to thank you because you saved my daughter. And I had no idea what she was talking about. Um, and she said, you know, she always comes home and tells me um, how you listen to her mm. and how you respond to some of the problems that are going on in her life. And she really needed somebody like that. Um, and at the time, I, I just thought I was saying good morning to a child. I, I just thought I was listening to another um, argument between two friends. And it was so much more about that. And I had no idea but I, I was willing to listen because to me, teachers and educators who listen to me are the reason why I'm here. They're the reason that I have been inspired to be in a classroom. Um, so I just keep thinking back on, on that mom and that dad who, who were thanking me for like saving their daughter. And I was like, I didn't do anything. And I, I felt like she had helped me just as much. I needed that that love in the morning sometimes because it was hard getting up some days. Mm -hmm. And so having that child be there every day for me, like truly asking me how I was doing was just incredible. But then to see that what I was doing in the classroom and even just listening to her was making a difference for her, um, that just has changed my life. Mm -hmm. um, going off of that, as a high school teacher, I'm not always cognizant of the impact that I'm making um, for my kids because they're high schoolers, they're very blasé about everything. Um, <laughs> but um, I teach a college prep class, so I teach um, an SAT skills class, and we were going over information about applying to f um, for financial aid one day. Um, and one student raised her hand and she asked, Mr., how was applying um, for how was applying to financial aid for you? And I told her that I didn't apply for financial aid because I wasn't qualified to apply for financial aid because I was undocumented when I was in high school. Um, and this student, she stayed in my classroom once all the other students have left and she told me, Mr. I can't apply to finan for financial aid either because I'm undocumented as well. So just being able to share my story with my students, I feel that I'm making a great impact because they're comfortable enough to approach me with these issues so that I'm able to help them. You know, he mentioned, you know, making the student feel comfortable. It is, that makes a huge difference. Um, uh, this is often happened, I, you know, I, I would say something, my students would, you know, do something that they wouldn't be supposed to be doing, and I'd, you know, there's, their response was like, Mr. Suena como mi mamá. You sound just like my mom. <laughs> you know? And... That, I mean, to me, that's, that shows me the kind of, you know, connection that I'm making with them because they, they, we come from very similar backgrounds. 
we come from very similar backgrounds. We've shared experiences, you know, maybe their, their families share the same experience that I do. And it just, that is something that I'm very thankful for um, because they know that I'm undocumented, documented. They know. And that just opens a whole world of new opportunities for them because first they see themselves in you and they, they, just, they just see you differently. And even the parents too. Just the fact that, you know, I am like, you know, I'm under on this situation, they can relate to you so much more, which leads to, you know, more parent involvement, which leads to, you know, more student success. It, 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 it's been such a great experience just to share this with them um, because it's brought so much positivity to, you know, the environment that I bring to the mm -hmm. classroom. I got very emotional as you asked that question because <laughs> so many stories started coming back to me of my students who are impacted by their immigration status or the status of their family members. Um, I had one student who came in later in the year and um, he had moved from one aunt to another. His mom had been deported and towards the end of the school year, um, she was trying to get back into the country. So I remember how stressed out he was, um, how he seemed to just not be there. Um, but, he, and he shared with me from the very beginning that his, um, his family didn't have papers. And my students are fourth graders, but they are very much aware of immigration and the impact that it has on their lives. Um, and it's challenging to, to sometimes feel helpless in those situations. But at the same time, I feel like what uh, Luis and Jaime talked about, sometimes it's about creating a safe space where your students can come with their stories, where they feel listened to. Because I know that growing up, um, I didn't necessarily feel that I could talk about those things. And my students, we talked about immigration a lot. And um, they understood that sometimes their parents couldn't get good jobs because they don't have a social security number. Um, I've had a mom call me to tell me, hey, um, my daughter's not going to be in because her dad was deported, so we have to go see him, and she needs to spend some time with him. And, and you, you have to allow that, you know, because it, it truly does impact their lives. And um, I worked with a group of fifth grade students on um, an exhibition project. I'm, an, I, I'm at an IB school. So for fifth graders to go on to middle school, they have to complete this project. And I was just crossing my fingers that I would get the immigration group. And I did. Um, so these four fifth graders amazed me, blew me away with their awareness of, um, of immigration, of wanting to make a change in the world by focusing on the stories of their parents, the stories of the community members around them. They acknowledge the courage there. Um, and they wanted to look at everything through that perspective specifically. Um, one of my students' parents came in and gave us an interview, and you know, she just started crying as she talked about um, why she was in this country despite the challenges, despite the discomforts, because she saw a better future in the United States for her two daughters. Um, and, you know, even my students who, who are okay with their immigration status, they, um, they signed the petition that these fifth graders um, created, which they sent to President Obama. President Obama, I hope you got our letter. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, they, um, so they created a change.org petition, and um, they, they were making comments as to why they supported. Uh, because I believe we all deserve a chance, because we're all created equal, because we all deserve love and respect. Um, 
And I don't know, for, for students at such a young age, I remember thinking at the beginning of the year, well, how am I going to bring it up and incorporate it into my personal status into my experience as a teacher? Um, and sometimes it's not necessarily about that. It's more about facilitating and creating a space where they can lead the way. You know, um, receiving documented status, no doubt, was a very important moment in you all's life. Um, I'd love for you to share with us, if you're comfortable, just how did it feel to realize that a door opened um, when this happened, and, and what, did, what, what action did you take, or would love to just hear um, a little bit about that. So when I received DACA status, I was so ready. I applied at the end of 2012, and it took 10 months for me to finally get it. I really thought that, you know, like, if they don't want me, just go ahead and reject me so that I can go ahead and plan my next moves. I'd um, actually been offered a job, and they waited for me for six months before finally saying, you know what, um, we have to give it to someone else, but let us know once you actually get um, DACA. So that was hard because right there again was the fact that despite you know being qualified for the position i wasn't able to to take it because of that lack of the social security number but i feel like because that opportunity didn't work out i was able to find out about um teach for america's stance on documented recipients uh like marissa was saying earlier i was doing research just randomly and i um I actually called Teach for America, their admissions office in New York, and I was just asking them about DACA, and she said, oh yeah, the, the prerequisites will be up in a couple weeks. We're uh, piloting the, the program in Denver, uh, and we're really hoping to take more, uh, more core members on. So that was amazing. I never, ever even fathomed the possibility of uh, becoming a teacher, and thanks to that delay, um, I was given the opportunity to be here today. Um, for me, receiving DACA just changed everything. So I wasn't able to do the small things that a lot of us don't think about, such as driving or even getting a stipend for my internship. So receiving DACA allowed me to apply for jobs. It allowed me to earn a paycheck with my name on it. So at one point I was, I just, at one point I just got so excited that I had four on-campus jobs and I was like, wait, I should, <laughs> I should probably quit <laughs> one of them. Um, but receiving, <laughs> receiving DACA was also very bittersweet for me because as a DACA recipient, even though I'm not a full citizen, um, I speak from a place of privilege because there are still a lot of people who um, can't even work. So when I received my DACA, um, unfortunately what came along with it was a rejection notice for my brother. So he did not receive DACA, unfortunately. So um, it was definitely a bittersweet moment for me and my family. I, I remember very clearly the year that uh, President Obama announced DACA because it was the same year I had a conversation with my mom, and I said, I don't want to be in this country like this anymore. Um, I'm going to graduate in two years, and what is that degree on the wall going to mean if I can't use it to work? And I said, let me go. Let me go back to Mexico. Let me live a life where I'm free. And she said, you can't do that because we're going to be separated. And we had come here fighting for this dream together. And she didn't want this to mean that it was, that we were no longer going to be that anymore. We weren't gonna be together. And she said, wait, Marissa, wait. Like something good is gonna happen. And I didn't know why she was so hopeful because I didn't have that hope she had. I didn't have that optimism my mom had. Um, and I kept looking and I kept researching how I could go back, where I could go to school there. Um, and in the summers, I cleaned houses with my mom, and I was cleaning, and I got a phone call from my friend, and she said, Marissa, turn on the news. 
this is huge. We're going to be able to have a social security number. We're going to be able to work. And I said, you're kidding. And she said, no. She said, please turn on the TV. Um, and so I remember that year because it was so pivotal for my life. It meant that I could graduate college and I could make that degree mean something. And not only for me, but because my mom had that hope um, that, that we were going to make it through and that, and that I was going to be able to be successful afterwards. So um, it, I just feel really overwhelmed with emotion just thinking about that day. You know, that, that's the reality of being undocumented and wanted to get a higher education. You don't know if you're going to be able to exercise that degree. I went, uh, I started at UT undocumented and I didn't know that I was going to be able to exercise my degree. I, I wasn't going to be able, I knew that I wasn't going to be able to teach even though I was working for it. And uh, yes, you feel desperate at times you don't know what to do because it felt at times that you were doing it for nothing but i i remember clearly when when that happened a friend of mine called me too and i was driving my bike on east riverside in austin i was driving to a pawn shop to pawn my high school graduation ring to buy uh, groceries for the week and my friend called me, and uh, she told me that those exact same words. Those exact same words. And I, I didn't know how to react to it. I mean, it felt so surreal, like it wasn't really happening. And I said, thank you for sharing that with me. Um, I didn't know what to say, and I called my parents, I told them, and just like broke down of excitement because I, was, I knew what, that I was going to be able to, you know, be in a classroom, you know, get a job. You know, I know my parents struggle. I know our parents struggle um, even paying their own bills and just putting someone through college. It's, it's, it's hard you know, with the limited resources that, especially in Texas, that we get. Um, and it changed my life. It's life-changing. It's life-changing to have that diploma on the wall where my parents live right now and actually putting it to work. It just changed my life, and I know it did to my parents too, my family. Um, thank you all for sharing that, those stories with us. Um, so I have one final question, and then we're going to wrap it up. Um, what advice do you all have? You know, so the, the, this is pathways uh, for becoming a documented teacher. What advice do you all have, practical, um, you know, as, as folks are considering, should I explore this? What are all the hoops and the how, you know, what the overwhelming nature potentially of, of pursuing this? I don't know. Can you share with folks who are thinking about going down this path um, any wisdom that you all have learned along the way? I called one of my friends who was a TFA alum um, from North Carolina when I was trying to make my decision about Teach for America, and I said, I don't know if I should do this. And he said, you're going to answer one question. After you answer this question, I'm going to tell you if you should or not. And I was like, oh, somebody's going to make the decision for me. This sounds, this sounds like a good idea. So he asked me, why are you doing it? And I, so I explained my story, and I told him why it mattered so much to me. And he said, you should go ahead and walk into that classroom in the fall. Um, and I think that you really have to ask yourself why you're doing it and for who you're doing it. Um, because that's what gives you that momentum on the days that you don't want to go back to school because the last day was really hard or you stayed up till two in the morning planning and making class packets 
that's what's going to give you that motivation to get up. So if you're doing it for the right reasons, if you can answer that question with true conviction and passion, then you should do it and you should pursue education because we need more classroom leaders and more leaders in education who are truly passionate and truly care about the issues and really want to work with the communities. So ask yourself that question, why am I here and why do I want to do this? And I think that once you've answered that question, um, you need to realize that I think our experience is incredibly valuable in the classroom because our students need role models who have been through their own personal challenges as they get that, that grit and that resilience that uh, Secretary Duncan was talking about earlier. Um, and I think that once you're in the classroom, you need to realize don't take anything personal in terms of misbehavior like every day is a new day and you need to take it one day at a time because you don't do that it's absolutely overwhelming going off of that um, teaching is definitely very very hard so during my first semester of teaching i would sit in my classroom once all the students have walked out and i would just decompress at my desk and I would cry. <laughs> um, one time my assistant principal walked familiar. in on me crying and that was very embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there were times where I really wanted to quit, um, but I stayed in the classroom because of the community that I surrounded myself with. So shout out to my roommates, Vanessa and Gloria, other Teach for America Corps members who really um, supported me through my first year of teaching. And um, the other teachers, the teachers across the hall, really helped me out as well, um, just listening um, to me and providing me with actionable solutions um, and being just so open with me and willing to help. So I feel that once you've answered that question and once you've decided to be a teacher, it's really important that you surround yourself with a community of people who really understand what you're doing and are really supportive of it. Yeah, don't, whatever, you you know, don't take it personal. They're, they'll be your harshest critics. Um, they'll notice, you know, if you wear the same pair of shoes for a week. Um, <laughs> it happened to me, yes. Very observant. Um, you have so much power. Uh, just being able to share that with them and connect them with those students. It's so powerful. Some, and it, you are changing their lives as a teacher. I'm not there because of the money, um, because <laughs> <laughs> said every teacher. Um, <laughs> you have to have the passion for it, and you know those ganas, you know, to uh, go to the classroom every day and just. Put your smile every day coming in. Something might have happened the day before, but that has to stay behind. Every day is a new day, and it's, it's very rewarding. It's very rewarding, you know, emotionally, you just a bond you create with these kids. And just everything you get to experience, it just opens your mind. You know, it's a whole new perspective. And if, you know, if you're up for that, it's definitely recommend doing it, especially if you're DACA. Great. I remember uh, my third year of teaching, one of my kids was looking at me very strange when I, in the morning when I picked them up and, and he just looked at me, he said, that shirt looks really strange on you. <laughs> Why are you wearing that? And I was like, I really liked it. And I never wore it again. Um, and it like has stayed with me. He's, they're so honest. Um, Brutally honest. <laughs> um, so, you know, you all are incredible and, you know, teaching is the hardest, but it is the most profound challenge that folks can choose to take on. Um, and my hope is that we will remain inspired um, because our kids need folks who fiercely believe in them, who fiercely believe that, that it, it, it is not okay that where kids happen to be born is dictates their life opportunities. Um, and we need more people 
who will stand up and decide to work for change in classrooms and outside of classrooms because that's what's going to change our nation and who believe it is possible to do in our lifetime because I have no doubt that you approach your classroom in a way that says no one is disposable. Our kids deserve the very best right now. Um, we can't wait another 100 years before our children have the opportunities um, that they deserve. Um, they, are, they, are, they are here. Um, they grew up in our playgrounds and deserve the very best. Um, so I just want to thank you all. Um, no doubt everyone watching wants to be like these folks. And so um, thank you for your leadership and for your honesty and for your stories and sharing a bit of yourselves with us um, this morning. So can we hear it for these awesome, awesome teachers? I think you're gonna I'll come on up. chat with us. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> so up next, we're gonna take a quick break. Um, if we can make sure that everybody is back in the room um, and seated by 10:15, that would be wonderful. But before we do that, I'd just like to say a couple of thank yous with to the folks without whom today would not be possible. Um, so first of all, uh, to Elisa and the team at TFA, thank you all so much uh, for helping with organizing this event. Um, and then to our colleagues at NEA and AFT who are in the room, thank you for your help. You've done, been amazing partners in a lot of our education work and we're very grateful. And then finally to uh, the CHCI fellows who are here today, uh, you guys are also doing incredible work and we're really proud of you, so thank you. And then lastly, uh, to my colleague Janae, who had to slip away for a moment, who will be right back. She has been an amazing partner in putting together this event. Um, she was weeping as all of you guys were uh, telling your stories, as I think we all were. And uh, I am, I'm grateful to her. She's, she's an amazing um, leader and uh, does such amazing work on immigration. So see you all back here right sharp at 1015. We're going to get started again, and again, what an amazing first half of the program. Um, I think it brought us all to tears. Uh, I'd now like to we welcome our second um, panel up onto the stage, and Alejandra Ceja, who is the Executive Director of the White House Initiative on Education Excellence for Hispanics, and has been a champion herself for Hispanics and diversity more broadly in education. Alejandra is going to lead us in a discussion on the community impact that the champions and that all of you are having um, as documented teachers. So Alejandra and the second panel, come on up. Buenos dias, good morning. Uh, that first panel was definitely inspiring. Just this whole convening has been very inspiring. And as somebody that has the opportunity to connect with teachers and students across the country, I just want to applaud you and TFA for the courage to create these pathways. Um, and so today is really a celebration about you all, the work you do, the community you serve. We don't have enough teachers in our classroom. Last fall marked the first time that our school system became majority minority. And we have 7.8% of teachers in the classroom that are Hispanic. So you guys are definitely uh, role models and an inspiration to all of us. So I wanted to use the time that we have together to talk about your stories. Um, to, for those folks watching and listening, um, how they also can get involved and, and talk about the teaching profession and the value add and the difference it's made, not just in, in your lives, but in your community. So, we're going to go ahead and get started. I, I can't guarantee that there won't be any tears, um, but I, I definitely can guarantee that you will walk away from today's event uh, inspired. And so we're, we're going to go ahead and get started. And I want to just turn it over to you to kind of introduce yourselves and let us know where your what community, where you serve. Thank you. Hi, my name is Maria Elena Dominguez. And I'm a first grade bilingual teacher at Rodriguez Elementary School in Austin, Texas. Uh, I've been teaching there for a little bit over two years since I received DACA. Um, I'm also a member of Education Austin. 
which is our local union, um, a merch local with NEA and uh, AFT. And um, that's basically it. Thank you. <laughs> Buenos dias. I am Yara Hidalgo. I, am, um, I was born in Mexico, Nayarit, Mexico. And I was brought to the United States when I was two years old. Um, I've lived in California ever since then. And uh, I currently teach um, middle school at Sacred Heart Nativity Schools in San Jose, back where I grew up in. And I'm um, the math and Spanish teacher. Um, and I'm also going to Santa Clara University for my master's in teaching and uh, the Catholic teachers program. Buenos dias, uh, my name is David Liendo, and this is actually, I just finished my first year, I'm teaching actually ESL and Spanish, and this is such a privilege to be here and then be able to share uh, my experience as a first year teacher and then core member of Teach for America. So it has been a wonderful experience and I'll be saying more in a little bit. <laughs> Hi, my name is Dinora Flores and I, I am of Mexican and Salvadorian heritage, and I was raised in, in Seattle. I teach second grade in the beautiful Navajo Nation. Hi, my name is Caspia Islam. Um, I am originally from Taka, Bangladesh, long ways away, small country. Uh, came here when I was six, a small city in uh, Texas, and I went to the University of Texas at Austin. Woo, hook em horns. Um, and <laughs> I just completed my first year as a Teach for America 2014 core member, teaching pre-K in the Houston area. Well, welcome everyone. So we, the earlier panel talked about pathways. Um, I want us to explore uh, uh, for this panel how you all have given back to your communities. But I'd want you to kind of um, share with, with uh, the folks here joining us, give us a glimpse into your classroom, into the community that you serve, the students you work with. Um, so open it up to anyone who wants to kind of uh, go first. I guess I'll take it. Um, so um, I work in Northwest Houston um, area. Most of my school is 96% Hispanic Latino population. I am the only non-bilingual pre-K teacher um, at my school. So I get a lot of mixed um, ethnicities in my classroom. I have a lot of um, first year um, kiddos from across all walks of the world. So people from Morocco, my kiddos from Saudi Arabia, some kids from Mexico. So it's a, a diverse population of kiddos. Um, in my classroom, when you walk in, you will see a lot of people of color. You're going to be able to hear Dene, um, as a lot of my students, all of my students are Dene people. Um, that does not mean that the one Filipino student in my classroom um, was, uh, her culture was left absent, not at all. I bring my language and I bring my culture into the classroom and my identity as an immigrant as well. Um, it's something that I can relate to, I can make relatable with my students who are uh, Native American. Okay, um, I forgot to say, but I was born and raised in Bolivia. And <laughs> Going back to this, I think um, I teach Spanish uh, in the Montbello community in Denver, Colorado, and it has been like I really found like a way to connect with my students. Like most of them are Hispanics, Latinos, and I found like a way to connect with them and tell them like you know what, like we need to embrace it. And then this is this is my roots, and then you should embrace it as well. And then it's something that I really have learned like. As like I feel like in high school I didn't have anyone to look up to saying like you know what like yeah I'm Hispanic and I, I, I am proud of it so I didn't have anyone to look up to it and then now that I'm a teacher it's like I'm Hispanic and I'm proud of it and then all my students feel like wow I have a, someone that I can connect with like someone that I can talk to someone that can understand my culture mm -hmm. and that for me mostly of my like most of my students are like I would say like 90% of my students are like uh, Latinos and it's like an amazing experience to feel like so home and like bring me tacos and like tamales and they're teaching me <laughs> all these different things like I'm like 
I'm not Mexican, but like they're teaching me, and then I'm so happy to learn. So, <laughs> but it's like it's like they are like treating me. They're like, we're gonna make you Mexican, Mister. Don't worry about it. So it's like <laughs> it feels good. <laughs> so I'm so proud of that, and I'm so proud to be teaching like t to learn from their culture and also to them, them f to learn from me, and then be inspired like that. Not feel like because I didn't feel that sense when I was in high school, and then like for me to deliver that message like you know what yes we need to like embrace it and say like yeah i'm latino and i'm proud of it and then we need to deliver that and then we need to show it and put the face in there and saying like yeah i'm proud and then we can do it and i think where we start is like high school and that's when we need to start realizing that like our roots and our identity like she said like it's just so amazing to be able to experience that um, so I, I, at my school, at Sacred Heart Nativity Schools, um, the student population is, I, I, can, I can say it's 100% Latino. Um, the last three years we had one, uh, one Vietnamese kid, um, but now I, he just recently graduated from our school, so it, it, it's now 100% Latino. Um, and I, it, I'm serving a community that's um, it's located south of downtown of San Jose. I grew up in the east side, but it's very it's very similar to I mean, to the east side of San Jose. Um, I I I connect very well with the kids um, because of my background. Um, somebody mentioned in the last panel uh, <laughs> that sometimes uh, the kids tell me, "Wow, Miss Hidalgo, you sound just like my mom." <laughs> And I think that brings a comfort um, with me too, uh, because then they don't just see that I'm I'm their teacher, but they can easily. I always share my background with them. I share my personal stories, my personal struggles, and I hope to inspire them and um, and seek those resources for themselves in my teaching practices. And there are times when I'm I'm teaching, and and as teachers, sometimes you know because we're we're a nation that's rooted in, in test scores and standardized testing. And sometimes we, we forget to be ourselves in the classrooms. We forget to, to, um, to, to sort of stray away from, from so much of the textbook or what's included in, in, in the textbooks. But when, our true, when my true self comes out and I, and I share my, my passions with them, that's when the conversation starts. That's when they're more inspired to, to learn and to pay attention and to do their homework. Um, so I, I, love, I love the community that I serve in. And I love working with parents. Our school is very small. So I get to really meet those family members and uh, we have constant parent meetings um, for, you know, to, to name the, the positives of their children and the, the areas for improvement. And, and that's something that's very unique to our school, that we know every student's um, walk of life and, and we try our best um, to be able to uh, meet the student where he or she may be at. I didn't mention this before, but I was born in Guanajuato, Mexico, and I um, I was brought here by my mother um, when I was nine. Um, I currently work at Rodriguez Elementary School, which is a school in uh, southeast uh, Austin. Uh, it's a Title I school, which means uh, about 90, over 96% of my students are on free or reduced lunch. Uh, I don't have the, the exact numbers, but uh, about 90% of the students at our school are Hispanics. Um, or, but um, our students that were born in the United States, but their parents, at least one of their parents, is from another country. In another country, I mean most of them are from Mexico, and of course we have some from uh, Central and South America. But um, my classroom is composed of mostly uh, um, Mexican-Americans. I had, this past year, I had one student who had just arrived from Honduras, and he was the only student in my classroom who was from another country. All the other students were US citizens. Um, but like I mentioned before, their parents, uh, most of the parents were born in another country. Um, Yara, you touched uh, upon this uh, subject that I think is very important to our community on parent engagement. Um, and as a, the daughter of, of immigrant parents, this was an issue in my household where my parents were intimidated 
by <coughs> the language, not, under, not speaking English and not knowing what kind of questions they should ask of my teachers. Um, I'd love to hear from you all what kind of, just drawing from your own personal experience, what strategies, what have you done to kind of help You've made the connection, obviously, with the students. How, have you, how are you making the connection with those parents to kind of create that, that environment where they can come in and feel comfortable and, and get information on the, the academic progress of their, of their children? I think I can start on that. Um, I actually, uh, I make uh, phone calls all the time. And I think my students are very, very aware of that. And they're like, Mister, why are you the only one that always call home? Like, you need to get over that. <laughs> and it's that thing always. And then they're like, you're the only, like, that can actually, I talk, I call them, and I call them, like, and, like, I talk to them in Spanish, and, like, como esta señora? And they already know that's me. And then, <laughs> because I make the announcement before I'm going to make the phone calls, and they're like, Mister, are you going to call home? What are you going to tell them? Please don't tell them bad things. I need to go out this weekend, and things like that. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I'm going to call them. I'm going to tell them about your report, how you're doing, uh, the things that you're missing, and then how much time you have to turn it in. And I tell them exactly what I'm going to say. They're already expecting a phone call. They go home and kind of like block the phones or like try to like, <laughs> he's lying or not. And then they kind of like confront me there. Like, but I think like pairing engagement, it's like one of the biggest things that uh, teachers can do. Like, most of my the parents that I have talked to, they are like, you're the only like you're the only teacher that always call me and then always tell me about how my kids doing and I'm always keeping track on all of them. Like you're doing bad in this class, you need to do this. Like you need to get it back on track. Like we need to get it together. Like let's do this. Let's meet up after school. How can I help you? Let's ask a teacher for stuff. And I feel parents feel like oh my god, like someone actually is calling me and they feel that like someone cares about my kid. And then sometimes when they don't get that phone call, they feel like, where's my kid? What are they doing? When they come like uh, parents night, it's not as much as like making that phone call and just talking to them like and delivering that, like, you know, your kid is doing well. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he or she has turned in her homework or they're doing an amazing job. And I, I thank you for like doing the great job they're doing with them. And they, they just feel like so, Thanksful, they feel like so like a reward for them. Like, they, yeah, I'm doing my job. And then their parents actually tell them or they're like, mister, why did you tell them that? I was like, well, because I really care about you. Like, uh, in those things, I think it's like what makes parents and then the teacher and the student like be a link. And they not only be like, you be like the delivery one and only teaching, but they also say, oh my God, he really cares about you. And I have like students that are undocumented in even like myself and they, they are like, you need to ask Mr. Liendo. And they, when I call home, they're like, oh, are you Mr. Liendo? And they're like, my, my son or daughter, they really feel inspired because of you. Thank you so much for what you're doing. And that makes me feel so good with myself. Like I am doing what I need to do. I am, I'm actually teaching them like that it's okay to be undocumented when I share with them. I told them like, I'm undocumented myself. And it was kind of like a day that I had so much frustra like frustration with myself and like with school and with administration, like everyone else, like their first year is the most tough like year ever. And I went through like this thing and it was like, I was like so like piled out with all these things. And I told them like, okay, I'm so frustrated. And I started crying in front of them. Someone like another person told me like you need to lower your standards and blah 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 and I was like I can lower my standard for my students I need to set them to these expectations and I told the parents this is my expectation this is my rules and they all agree with it and now like you're telling me to lower my expectation like so those things like make me feel like yes you're here and they feel like in a safe environment they feel like I can do this and then I even myself when I was in high school I never shared about myself like being undocumented I never said like this is like I think that we need to talk about like I I was ashamed of being undocumented and then like now I'm like why should I be ashamed I didn't steal I didn't do anything wrong I'm just like I just broke the rule like I just broke the system and I'm just here to help and then contributing uh, and giving back to my community and it's something that I'm actually very blessed and thankful like I have learned so much from um, Gabby Pacheco that is right in the back 
Grace and a lot of other people that has be, been my mentor and I have learned so much that this is a thing that we always have to talk about and then be in, like embrace it. Like I'm undocumented and I am putting the face for it. Thank you and I appreciate that question because I think a lot of people are gonna be watching this and it is very important that um, our parents know, our community knows that we need our parents at our schools. I think uh, one of the things I've learned throughout uh, my career is that this work cannot be done alone. We need parents, we need the community, we need to build those relationships that are gonna help us support our schools, our students. We can't do it alone, it's impossible, it's a lot of work, it's overwhelming, and we all agree sometimes we lack time. That's one of the main, uh, our main concerns, our struggles. So bringing the parents, uh, having those conversations with them, um, calling them, I think that's very important. And another thing, I think um, if they don't come to us, we have to go to them. So one of the things, and I haven't done it, I think I did it once in the past, but uh, one of my plans next year is for uh, me to make home visits. And I know there's certain regulations that we need to follow, and it is important, but I think, our parents are working two jobs. My mom, she's here. Um, growing up, I understand that because she was a single parent. I lost my father when I was nine. And she had to raise four children. And she had two jobs. She would get home at night after working all day, and my brother would take care of us. And I understand that. I understand that when I hear that from my parents. You know what, maestra? I can't, I can't help him with his homework because I was out all day. I was working. And to me, I see the struggle of those parents. Yes, we need to get them engaged, but sometimes if they can come to us, we have to go to them. So maybe making those home visits. Um, another thing, and that's one of the things that I'm doing with Education Austin, AFT and NEA, it's um, we're providing DACA and DAPA uh, forums, which are educational uh, forums where we explain this, these are requirements for DACA. This is what you have to do. These are the documents you have to collect uh, for the parents for DAPA. We have to get them prepared so whenever that executive action takes place, they're going to be ready for it. And I really hope that it does, the injunction is lifted because that's going to make a difference in the way we educate our kids, but also um, th their lives at home. It's gonna make it a lot easier for the, their parents to obtain jobs where they don't have to work two jobs. So. And like I said before, we have to be supported. We have to do the work as a team. And that's what I tell my kids. I can't do the work alone. I can, I can I'm, I'm, either, uh, I'm your teacher, but you have to do your part, and they're first grade. And uh, those expectations have to be uh, set at the beginning of the school year. We are both responsible for your education, along with the parents, parents, teachers, community, students. We, can, we have to do it together. We can't do it alone. Thank you. So um, besides the, the phone calls, as we've, uh, we've already mentioned, um, I, I always try to, to make a personal connection with the parents when I first meet them at the beginning of the school year. Um, and I also think about, I, whenever I interact with the parent, I always, uh, I always see parents as, when I see my, my students' parents, I see my own parents in them. And, and having that in mind in, in addressing issues, uh, whether that's behavior, I always keep in, in mind what would, what would the parent be, or what is the parent thinking right now as I'm making this phone call? That they're not good enough, that they're not providing enough support because their student is misbehaving, or because he, his student or their student is, is not achieving um, at, a, at the expectation that they would like him to or her to achieve at. But I think that having those conversations and ways of how can we both help these students, your student, for academic success. And I always bring in the, the um, our school connects our students with private Catholic um, high schools. And, um, but I always bring in that aspect of college. What are we doing right now so that we can continue to support our students 
to to go to high to go beyond high school to go to college because they will go to college and um we haven't done uh, much of the forms, but that's a, that's something that's an idea that I'm I'm willing to explore. Um, I think it's very important that our parents know their rights as immigrants. Um, I've done a lot of advocacy work um, in the immigrants' rights community and with different organizations. So I think that that is something bringing our own skills as teachers, the things that we we were involved in when we were in college, and that we can bring in um, into our our schools because we are. I mean, we are agents for change, and we also get to um, uh, provide. Sometimes, sometimes I think that the resources are out there, uh, but the lack of knowledge of those resources, it's what really has um, communities at, at the place where they're at. So we as educators need to bring that in and uh, need to make that aware, uh, make that aware to parents. And um, another idea that you kind of touched upon um, is the idea of funds of knowledge. Um, sometimes we have our parents coming as assistants, as you know, helping either grade or clean up the school or something. But I think that the, our parents bring in something a lot deeper than that. And we as educators need to find different ways to bring in that aspect. What funds of knowledge, what, what things are done at home that can be um, replicated in the classroom or can be mentioned in the classroom and make that connection to our curriculum. And I think that's where the conversations can start. In my classroom, because this is um, my kiddo's first year um, in school, what I have a conversation with my parents first and foremost is the safety of their kids. Like, my first concern is the safety of your kids, and my second concern is that they become lifelong lovers of education, that I instill something so that they can go in the steps of elementary school, and middle school, and high school wanting to learn and wanting to be in school and inspired by their teachers. So I want to give them that foundation so we have that conversation early on. And um, it's hard because there's so many language barriers in my classroom, and I remember a specific time when I could not reach out to one of my kiddos. His parents spoke only Arabic. And I know bits and pieces of Arabic. I could never get them on the phone, and they wouldn't be able to come in. I think it was because they were, it was sad because they wanted to communicate with me, but they couldn't, and I couldn't fully communicate with them. So I wanted to help them realize that they can still be a part of their child's education. And so I went to my parents and I wrote out a note in Arabic and went to Google Translate and made sure the note was correct and made sure my parents knew what I was talking about. And I sent that note home um, with the student. The next day I got a call from their uncle who spoke limited English and um, he was on the phone. He was like, thank you so much for this note. Um, it means a lot to me because they just moved from Jordan. Um, and to know that they could call me, even though they were scared to call me. Um, I was very blessed that they felt that they could do that and that it was a safe place for them to still have communication, as limited as it was, to, for them to know that they could reach out to their educators, to the people in their school, uh, to make a difference for their kiddos, especially because this is when they're going to start all of their educational success, and that is what it's going to be. It's going to be successes, no matter what the barriers are. So um, that was a main concern for me, and I always did glows and grows with my kiddos. Um, uh, so notes home. It's like, these are your glows for today. I'm really excited because you did this so well and you communicated with your friends and um, you did this really great. And this is what we can grow on. We're like trees. So we always have to grow more and more. Um, and I think that hits a lot with them because they don't really understand what all of that means all the time. So you have to break it down for them. And I felt like at the end of the year, they're like, okay, Mrs. Um, what are my grows? What can I grow on today? And that was really powerful for me, that they were self-aware and critically thinking about um, what they can do to better themselves um, and inside the classroom and outside of the classroom. And I think having that conversation with the parents along with my children, being like, we're a family, and that's it. We're a family, and families care for each other. And if something's going on, you tell me. If something's going on, I tell you and your parents, because we're all a family together. And they really, I think, respected each other more because of that. And so I think it's so important important to reach out to your parents no matter what it is or what language they may speak or what walks of life they may come from because it's so important for them to feel safe um, especially with their kids being in your classroom. Thank you. I think that one of the best 
things that I've learned being, um, and, I, and I hate this prefix, undocumented. I don't feel like I'm lacking anything. I feel very uh, capable of, of a lot of things. Um, but one of the best things that has come from that has been thinking creatively and how to solve problems. And I think that's one of the lessons that I, if anything, throughout the year that I want my students to get out of my classroom is that they can solve problems no matter what barrier. And that I am not going to use any excuse or any limitation that they might come at me with. And that goes for parents as well. Um, and that also means asking the tough questions. Um, for example, um, I had a student uh, whose parents said that they couldn't come to school for, the, for a whole week. Um, and I could, have, I could have said, okay, let the office know and make sure you've got all that taken care of. Um, but instead, um, I, I realized that I had to get a little bit more personal and had, I had to ask why. And I also had to ask, what can we do? Because we, we have a partnership here. Mm -hmm. I am responsible for your child and so are you. Working in this partnership, what can we do to make sure she doesn't miss that week of school? Um, and I think that having those difficult conversations with your parents is something that is gonna make a difference. Not being afraid to have those difficult conversations um, and thinking creatively about <laughs> solutions because a lot of us sitting in this room have had to do that. We have had to go the long route. We have had to pu push things aside in order to achieve what we wanted to achieve. Um, but another very simple solution that I have to keeping that parent communication is sending out parent homework. Um, whether that means that they sign the, the homework when they are done completing it, if they're not there to see them do the homework, if a child's at least taking the time even by themselves to do work and then a parent signs, the parent knows that their child did it and I know that the parent's aware of what their child is doing at school. Um, and I think things as simple as that and the best thing about second grade is that they take everything very seriously. <laughs> so if, if the parent has homework, they're gonna make sure the parent gets their homework done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, as teachers, you all have the power to transform lives um, and to shape our future workforce. I wanted to take some time and just hear from you all. You're definitely an inspiration to me and to the students you serve um, and to our country. I want to ask you, who inspires you? Um, my role model uh, since growing up has been my mother. And she's not an actress, she's not a president, but she is my mother. And thanks to her, I'm here. Um, thanks to her decision to cross that border undocumented, I am here. That's why now I'm making a difference in the lives of my kids. And. She is what, what keeps me going. Um, growing up, I always thought, you know what, one day, mom, you're, you're not gonna be working two jobs because I'm gonna, I'm gonna support you. When you're little, you think you can do anything. And um, now I help her, but not, not as much as I, I would like to. But she would always be my role model. She's the person I'm gonna look up to because she has inspired me to be who I am, to fight for what I believe, to, to share my story, because everybody has a story, right? We're all here, everybody sitting in this, in this room has a story, uh, how we got here. We had to overcome struggles, um, but we did it because we had a role model. We had somebody that we were looking forward to, somebody that we wanted to to honor and to me that's my mother and in a lot of it in our classrooms our kids their role models are their parents but at the at the same time we become their role models and and i feel proud of that that's one of the reasons why i think i chose this profession because i want my students to not only see me as a teacher but also see me as someone that they can trust that they can feel safe to, um, coming to and talking to about anything. Um, and, and it is important for everybody to have a role model. And I'm very proud to say that um, my role model is here. She's 
sitting right there. Thank you, Mama. Similar to Maria, I, I have many role models, and those role models comprise of uh, the woman in my family who have, um, beginning with my mom, who as a 21-year-old decided she, she needed something better for her family. She needed something better for her daughter. Um, her resources were very limited uh, growing up in Mexico. Um, she, she was a smart young lady, but she couldn't, she couldn't continue her high school education because her family needed her to rise up as her mother died when she was 10 years old. And she needed to, to work and support her brothers and sisters. And all my accomplishments, I owe to her, to her, to her support. She never doubted me along the way times in high school where I just wanted to give up, senior year of high school where I, I, I didn't even know if I was gonna go to college. Um, and, and I tried my best in applying to as many scholarships as possible. And there were times when I would, as that deadline, May 1st was coming to closer and we had to say yes to a school, to commit to a school. And I, I wasn't sure financial aid was just not promising. And I would close myself up in the bathroom and I would just cry and cry. And my mom, I didn't know this, but um, until years after when she told me, uh, she would be on the other side of the door crying with me and praying that, that a miracle would happen. And I, I also look up to my, my Aunt Lucy. She, she's worked in the fields. She's, um, She's gone through it all. She, she's really taught me hard work, just as my, mo my mother has taught me. She's taught me what it is to get up at 5 in the morning and end work at 2 in the morning the next day and have three hours of sleep and still keep going because she has kids that she needs to raise and she needs to provide food on the table for. And um, I, I can go on and on the list of, of women in my family who have inspired me. And, and like Maria said, they're not actors, they're not pro professionals, but they're, they're professionals in, in their own way. And through their hard work, I, I'm here. And they've really led that, that way, that with determination, persistence, you never give up. Todo se puede, mija. Nunca te dejes dar por vencida. Those are the words that they always, always tell me. Actually, this is um, a rough question for me. I have not seen my mom in nine years, and it's like... Uh, like, my mom is my role model. I love her so much. She was the one, like, when I had the opportunity to come to the U.S. for a karate competition, she was the one, like, I know you're going to do it. I know you can make it. And all my effort, all that, like, like waking up early, like, doing all this hard work, sleeping three hours a day, I don't care, but, like, I did it for her. She actually was the one like, like taught me so much in my life. Like that got me like, you're gonna do this. You can do it. I believe in you. When I had a call and I had to tell him, I got a scholarship, I got in the newspaper, I got this. And she's like, I'm so proud of you, hijo. Like, I'm so proud of you. Like no one in the family has ever done what you are doing. And not being with her, not being able to share with her like those moments when I crossed the stage graduating from a top university, like those moments like graduating from high school as like top student, like we're like are missing there. And at the same time, I want to say like, thank you so much for everything you have done. She has done so much for me. Like she always put her hands on the fire for me. Like she was like, you're going to do it. I'm going to send you. It's OK. Provide me with everything never like i never even thought about it when i was like um, a middle school student like thinking about where is she getting the money like how much is she working like never thought about it 
and then now that like I'm here like getting this it's such a thrill like I'm like mom guess what I made it to the White House and I got this nomination and everything <laughs> she's like <laughs> She's like, Mijo, I'm so proud of you. Like, you have done all the things that I never done. I didn't graduate from college. I didn't do this. And you did it all. Like, you are making me so proud. You're putting the name outside. You're giving, like, everything for yourself. And I, I swear to God, like, these nine years has been the most painful time. Like, sometimes I ask myself, was it worth it? Did I, did, did I take the right choice? And at the end of the day, I always think, like, I took the right choice. I'm making also her dream possible and my dream possible that, like, are alive. That, yes, we have opportunities and we can do it. Even despite that, that if we're not, we don't have the nice social security number, like, I'm doing it. And I feel like without it, like, when I was in high school, like, I cried so much, like, my senior year, I was like, I shouldn't even go to school anymore. Like, just, it's not possible. Like, I'm not gonna make it to college. And I was just like, one of those person that was like on Google searching, like, can I make it? Like, are there undocumented students? And like, <laughs> and I got some like, I, there were some like, some good news and I was like, oh, this person made it. And then I got into like this big scholarship and like, I was like, I can make it, I can do it. Like. I have been doing all the work, and then, like, uh, actually an educator, Miss Becker, that I'm so thankful, I wish she was here too. She was the one that, like, actually gave me those words, like, you can do it. Um, I was just here apart. I was like, I'm not gonna make it to college. I just, I was like, I should give up. Like, everyone else in my family told me I should have started working in construction. That was the mentality that was given to me coming to the US, working construction, get money and send it home. But I never thought about it. For me it has been always like, I wanna get an education. I know I can make it better. I know I can go higher. And I know I can make my mom's dreams successful in myself now. And that educator, like Miss Becker, I'm always so thankful to her because like she took care of me when I was feeling dejected, like I was feeling so sad, I was crying the whole way. I was feeling like the world is end for me. Like after high school, what's gonna happen? Where am I gonna go? Like it didn't matter if I had like twenty-two thousand dollars in scholarship, but like I was not gonna be able to pay my like as out of state tuition. And those things were like, and there is so much work still to do for immigration, like in-state tuition for all undocumented students will be the best thing that we can do. And I think for myself, like when I was going through this, it was like, I can't do it. And then she was just like there. And like, she picked me up from anywhere I was. She will get me. She sent me to like a trip to Cornell. I became her alma mater. Like I graduated from where she graduated. We said like, I was in the same, actually in the same building that she went to. And it was just like, she came to my graduation and to see her, she took that role of a mod, like a mother for me here in the US. Like I didn't have that one, that person here. Like she was the person also inspired me and my mom, like I'm so blessed and thankful to them. Like there are no words to say like, mom, I love you so much. And I hope you see this uh, sometime soon, but you are my inspiration. Every single thing that I got now and that awards that I got is for you. And I love you so much. So, um, like many of my other peers, my mom and dad definitely made the most impact in my life. My amu and abu. Um, and they couldn't be here today. So hopefully they're watching um, after this gets put out. But my mom, my dad, when I was really young in Bangladesh, worked overseas in Canada and came to the United States. And so I didn't see him much and I forgot what he looked like. And my mom made a decision to be with my dad so that we can be together as a family. And uh, so we came here when I was six and I couldn't recognize my dad and that was really hard. And it was hard because I had to relearn how to love him. So that was hard. Um, but I knew from when I was younger that they were doing it all for me. And uh, 
they've never gone back to Bangladesh because they can't and they haven't seen any of their family and so it's just been us my dad my mom and eventually my sister who's 15 and so it's been very hard but also very rewarding to have them as a part of my life because they have sacrificed their entire lives just like many of our other friends here sacrifice their entire lives to give us a chance for a better one. So I'm very thankful, I'm so grateful for that. And um, when I joined Teach for America, I was unsure of my future and what it held. So I called my dad, like I always do. And uh, Abu picked up the phone, he's like, hey kiddo, how are you? <laughs> I was like, hey daddy yo, what's going on? And I was like, I just have to tell you, uh, I got Teach for America. And he goes, yeah! And he's just, all, just so excited on the phone, telling all his customers at the <laughs> store, my daughter's gonna be a teacher, my daughter's gonna be a teacher. <laughs> when I was so unsure of it myself, um, and he's like, <laughs> and he, he's on the phone, he's like, listen, your teaching is in your bloodline, and because <laughs> my grandparents were teachers, my aunts back home are teachers, um, He's like, teaching is such an honorable profession, such an honorable profession, and you should understand that. Um, and, and he just affirmed so many things that I couldn't in myself, and he's like, do you know how proud I am of you and how proud I am that you get to inspire those kids in your classroom every single day? Um, and, you just, and he told me, you know, you be the best for them because um, we've tried to give you the best we can, but you be the best for them now because you're another parent for them. Mm -hmm. So you work hard and teaching is gonna be very hard and you're gonna be sad, but we're gonna be here and your kids need you, so you need to be there for your kids. Um, that was like the first day I heard about Teach for America and I knew I was gonna be a teacher, so it was all very <laughs> overwhelming, but uh, my parents have always been uh, the rock and my light at the end of the tunnel. So I'm very, very grateful for them. And in two folds, grateful for my teachers who were my second parents um, in high school, and my counselors who've done so much tirelessly to look through all the documentation that I needed for college, scholarships that I may need, driving me to different community colleges, to different um, universities, because I couldn't drive. I didn't know where to go. Um, and much like David, one of my teachers, Mr. Daniel, he went to UT, he was an alum, and he's like, you need to go to a good school because that brain of yours needs to work and you need to work your brain. I'm like, okay, Mr. Daniel. And uh, he worked tirelessly to get me the paperwork and call his alumni connections and see what I could do. And without these pivotal and such influential teachers and people in my life, there's no way that I could have even imagined being a teacher, having a job, so grateful to be up on this stage with all of you influential people that inspire me every single day to do what I do. Um, those people definitely deserve the credit. They definitely did the work and they definitely put the dedication and passion in myself um, to move forward and to look at every day in the eyes of those teachers um, who were always there for me, my parents who have always been there for me. Um, so they definitely are my inspiration and the wind beneath my wings, so to speak. <laughs> so I'm very thankful for that. Um, I want to thank our, I want to thank our our panelists. We're we're out of time. I want to thank them for their inspiring stories, for sharing. You definitely are the future of this country, and I want to thank you for the contributions you're making and for inspiring that next generation of, of leaders in, in, in and out of the classroom. So can you please join me in giving them a big round of applause? Thank you again to our amazing panelists. I mean, I don't think there's a, a dry eye in the house. So uh, these stories have been so inspirational. And, and again, we, we thank you for your commitment um, as educators and to your community. So thank you again. So a big round of applause for our panelists one more time. At this time, it's my distinct honor to welcome Valerie Jarrett, Senior Advisor to the President. Thank you so much for being here with us today.
Well, good morning, everyone. Morning. Welcome to the White House. Having a good time? Yeah. I never get tired of saying welcome to the White House. I can't believe I work here. It's six and a half years later, and I still can't <laughs> believe it. It's as good as it gets. But one of uh, we see amazing things here every single day. We meet with people from around the country, in fact, from around the world. But there is nothing we do that is more inspirational to me than Champions of Change. And the reason why is it gives us a chance to lift up here in Washington for everyone to see around the country people who are just ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And so to the champions, many of who we heard from and all of who I've read all about, you rock. You just rock, that's as simple as that. And I wanna just begin by just showing our appreciation to you one more time. And let's, could we applaud and have all the champions stand up just one more time, all of you. Thank you. Thank you, and, and as we've heard, many of you have come such an extraordinary way you have overcome enormous obstacles. You have been resilient and tenacious, and you've done it with spirit and uh, heart and grace. And I think you would all admit, as you just heard from this panel, that none of you would be here if there wasn't somebody special in your life who believed in you. And I will say this to those of you, to all of you, but particularly to those of you who don't have parents here, and I, I say this to you not as a senior advisor to the president, I say this to you as a mom, that as a mom, there's nothing you want more in life than for your children to do well. And whether you're with them or whether they're far away, you want them to be as happy as possible and know that they're getting that fair shot to aspire to their dreams, no matter what their dreams may be. And it, I know, and I could see in the tears that the separation from your parents is hard on you, but your parents are so proud of you. I can't think of anything that would make me more proud than for my daughter to get the recognition that you all are having today. And so I know it's hard and you have a heavy heart when they're not physically here with you to wrap their arms around you. I'm gonna give each of you a hug as though I'm your parent <laughs> when we're done here today. Uh, but just know, this is all they want for you. They just want you to get that fair shot. And for you to be here in this great country and choose to be educators choose to give back to the next generation. You stand on the shoulders of those who helped you, but just think of what you're doing for the next generation. You're giving it back and you're paying it forward. And that is what this is really all about, is to put the showcase and spotlight on you and lift you up and let the world see what America is at its very best. We have always been a nation of immigrants. Everybody, unless you're Native American, you came from somewhere else. Uh, and one of my favorite lines that the president used, isn't that right, is before, before we were us, we were them. Before we were us, we were them. So I say to all the folks, uh, and you hear it in the press all the time, who say really outrageous things, our country is strong because of our diversity. Our country is strong because we have always been welcoming to people from all over the world. Everyone looks at the United States as a beacon of opportunity a beacon of hope. They believe in our values, they believe in our democracy, they believe in our inclusiveness. And you give us a chance to show that at the absolute highest level. So I wanna thank the champs. I wanna thank everyone who's here who supported the champs. I wanna thank all the people from around the world who are looking at your superstars here and you'll have a real special place in your heart knowing that you raised some extraordinary gifted people and to all of the advisors and counselors and everybody in the life, mentors, one person can make such a huge difference. We had a young man who used to work in the White House um, who I took a special interest in and he told the story about how he grew up and had hard times and I said, but look, you're working in the White House. I said, how did that happen? He said, you know, my mom always told me I could do anything I set my mind to and he said, I believe that children aspire to the expectations that people they love set for them. You aspire, you aspire to the expectations. And so if we set low expectations, then our children tend to not thrive, unless they're really, really resilient. But if somebody in your life believes in you and says you can do absolutely whatever you wanna do, and then you in turn decide what you're gonna do, 
is to help the next generation and be educators just doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> My mom spent her life focusing on early childhood education, and so I know. <laughs> That's why I mentioned it. Uh, and so we've got to help them from the time that they're three and four, really to the time they're born, all the way through uh, school so that they can achieve and grow and make our country continue to be strong and that's what y'all are about and so I am so deeply proud of all of you all of you thank you so much thank you so now I have the pleasure of introducing to you somebody who you do not need who does not need an introduction a famous actor an accomplished actor a fierce advocate for uh, immigration rights, and I have to tell you, one of my favorite TV shows, Orange is New Black. <laughs> it, and what I love about Netflix, this is not a commercial for Netflix, but I will say, <laughs> given, given our work here, you can imagine that it, there's nothing better than to be able to watch what you want to watch whenever you want to watch it. And if you want to watch the whole season as I did at one time, one weekend, not one sitting, but one whole weekend, then you get to do that. Um, and so please join me in welcoming Diana Guerrero. And also I have to mention, obviously, Jane the Virgin. She's well known for that as well. So come on up and... Wow, Valerie, that was generous. Uh, <laughs> but it's nice that some people think that. Um, it is a great honor to be here today. I am particularly proud to help recognize Jamie, Maria, Yara, Caspia, Luis, Marisa, Dinora, David, and Rosario. Rosario. That's right, I speak Spanish. <laughs> I can roll my R's. Uh, thank you for your work as documented teachers. And thank you to the White House for hosting this special event and inviting me to be here with you today. Really, what were you thinking? <laughs> Just, I'm, I'm gonna ruin this entire thing. No, let's, fingers crossed. The White House Champions of Change program honors ordinary Americans who are doing extraordinary things in their communities. Each of these nine Americans being honored here today are not ordinary, Amer ordinary Americans. They are truly extraordinary. They are doing important work in their communities and in their classrooms as DACA recipients who have become teachers of students from pre-kindergarten to high school. You are extraordinary because you have overcome great hurdles in your young lives to succeed, challenges that most Americans have not experienced. For almost all of your lives, you and your families have had to stare down the fears of deportation. When your school friends started getting driver's licenses and driving to school and part-time jobs, you could not apply. You probably also had trouble finding work or getting a college student loan. You have faced a long list of challenges because of your status. But when President Obama began the DACA program, by the way, is the president here? Anywhere? No? No one told him I was coming? All right. All right, that's fine. He's off doing important things like saving America. Um, my, my jokes are terrible today. Somebody help me. Comedy gods, come on. Um, he offered you the chance to become lawfully present and become eligible to apply for a work permit. You seized the opportunity. You finished college and became teachers, and then you set new goals. You have worked harder to include parents in schools, even doing home visits. You have included more of your culture in your curriculum. And you have worked to close the education gap in your cities, a passion many of you developed as members of Teach America Corps. Sorry, Teach for America Corps. Again, I told you this, this was not a good idea. <laughs> Where you learn that social justice includes education equality for all children, including children of underrepresented communities. Supporting our community and mentoring each other is a common thread in your stories. For example, Jamie from Los Angeles is working on his master's degree while teaching high school chemistry at Animo College Preparatory Academy, a public charter school in the heart of the Watts neighborhood in Los Angeles. Yara of San Jose, California teaches math and Spanish at Sacred Heart Nativity Schools while working on, masters, on a master's for Catholic school teachers. 
Yara is also a member of the Latina Coalition of Silicon Valley and Engaged Latina Leadership Activist Program, EDA, where she works on issues such as wage theft that affect Latina women in the Silicon Valley. She constantly strives to educate and empower youth and women to rise above society's expectations to be strong leaders in their community. Maria from Austin, Texas is a first grade bilingual teacher. She is also a union leader who has worked with her union and others on citizenship, on citizenship drives and DACA clinics. I mention these stories because they touch upon the work that I am doing. And I'm not talking about wearing orange and khaki and pretending to be in prison, although we do tell important stories. Though I love my job as an actor, I also have a passion to get young people civically engaged. In fact, I'm thinking of changing my profession because of you guys. Thank you very much. Um, again, bad joke. Wow, it's not <laughs> jibby. Come on. You said this was good. All right. <laughs> After I shared my story about my family being separated by deportation 15 years ago, I, like you, wanted to do more to help our community. Like you, I have urged immigrants to learn about the expanded DACA and DAPA programs that the president announced last November. By the way, Valerie, has he come in yet? <laughs> Nothing. Oh. Is that why? OK, all right. Well, we'll leave that joke at the door then. Um, <laughs> no, where was I? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, like you, I have expressed anger and frustration with conservative politicians who opposed immigration and went to court to stop the president's programs. I know that politicians won't listen to us unless we stand up and make ourselves be heard. And the best way for us to be heard is to vote. Even though you are not eligible to vote, you can help. As teachers, you are leading young students by your example. You inspire your students and your communities to achieve. Give them one more challenge. Urge them to become civically engaged so that all of our lives and those of our parents will benefit from our hard work. Encourage them to apply for citizenship if they are eligible. And if they are citizens, remind them to register to vote and show up on election day. And if they are like you, dreamers, waiting for the chance to become citizens, they can help mobilize our community to vote. We have to support each other and learn from each other and help each other advance. I didn't know what that meant until I decided to share my story. I was overwhelmed and I was scared and I felt that I would be harshly judged and maybe even set, uh, suffer a career setback because I had spoken out. Um, I had a joke prepared, but I'm not even gonna try it. I'm just not gonna, I'm not, all right, I'll do it. I thought I'd never work in this town again, see? No. <laughs> it's my 1920s wise guy, all right, yikes. A crowd. Uh, the public response was great, but it was also negative. But there was one experience that still remains with me today. I was in a coffee shop and a young lady approached me. I was surprised because she looked just like me. I thought I was looking at a reflection of my 17-year-old self. She began to cry, and I thought to myself, oh boy. She must really like the show. <laughs> but why is she crying over me? I have like two lines an episode, you know? It's not much to work from, but. Um, then to my surprise, she said, I read about your story and I saw you on CNN. That was when Michaela Pereira Oprahed me and I began to cry. Uh, she said, I am Mexican American and my parents are undocumented. I am so afraid they will be taken away. I said, you are not alone. I urged her to take action now. Educate yourself and educate your parents and find out what your options are. Knowledge is power, but I don't have to tell a room full of teachers that, right? I'm sure you wake yourselves up at night saying that. <laughs> <laughs> knowledge is power. <laughs> power, knowledge. I used that one, Jimmy. It worked, I think. So many of us are afraid because we don't know the law. It's also because the law isn't clear. <laughs> we'll leave that one there. The same young lady sent me a message to thank me 
because she no longer felt alone. She was doing everything in her power to get involved, edu educating herself and others. This solidified my purpose, and I no longer felt alone. We know we will succeed by working together. There are more than 650,000 DACA recipients from the 2012 program. If we all work together as a community, we can achieve the policy changes that respect all of us, whether we are immigrants, citizen children of immigrants, or multi-generational Americans. Our nation was founded on the principles of justice and equality. We are all equal, regardless of, our, of the color of our skin or where we were born. We are all equal, regardless of our religion, our wealth, or sexual orientation. Unfortunately, we don't find that justice in today's immigration system, but we cannot give up. We have waited too long for immigration reform that keeps our families together, and we cannot stop working towards that goal. In the meantime, President Obama created the DACA program that has greatly benefited, benefited our country, and we know that because you guys are here. Now it's up to us to continue moving forward and prove the program's success and achieve a permanent solution. As champions of change, we have to make sure that the momentum continues. I hope you join me in this campaign and let our voices be heard. Thank you so much for your hard work and for showing our nation that we are America and that we are ready to lead. So thank you. Diane, thank you again so much for being here. Uh, you're a true inspiration uh, to all the educators here today and, and for your kind words. Um, before I introduce our uh, final speaker, I do want to say a special uh, thank you to Catherine Gologali. Where is she? She might have stepped out, but she was a huge help in putting this event together. So a, a round of applause for Catherine. <laughs> And without further ado, our next speaker has been a true champion uh, for the immigration community and on issues that are so important to our families. Please help me in welcoming the director of the White House Domestic Policy Council, Cecilia Munoz. Thank you. So when Janae signed me up to be the closing speaker, she did not let on that I'd be following both. Valerie Jarrett and Diane Guerrero. I never would have agreed to do that. Um, except that um, as much as uh, Valerie talked about um, how important it is for us to be lifting you up and lifting up your work and your voices and your stories, uh, the dirty little secret about Champs of Change events is that we take so much more inspiration from it than anything we're able to offer. Um, I've been looking forward to this all week um, because here you are. Um, and this fight that Diane just talked about so eloquently is such a real and vivid thing, and we can all talk about it and we can all lift up, up examples, but nothing is more powerful than you and your stories and your accomplishments. Um, and so it's just, it really is a tremendous inspiration to those of us here on the administration team who, who work on these issues. Um, so thank you for that, and thank you for what you do every day. Um, this fight this conversation that we've been having, the thing which you illustrate so eloquently with your work and with your voices and with your lives, um, is a battle that started when I think many of you were quite small, um, back when the DREAM Act was the Student Adjustment Act of 2001, which was the first time it was introduced, which got introduced by a bipartisan group in the House and the Senate. Um, one of those senators on the other side of the aisle was the first sponsor of this legislation, but didn't vote for it when it was on the Senate floor in 2010. So it gives you a, a sense of the trajectory of this debate. Um, it's a debate, obviously, which continues, um, and which this president is deeply committed to, uh, and his team is deeply committed to, and which we know will ultimately be successful. And we know that because we know the power that you have and that your voices have, which um, we're proud to be lifting up today. So. We fight to pass the DREAM Act. We fight to pass comprehensive immigration reform. It is still a question of when, not a question of if. But 
even as we fight that fight uh, and we have disappointments along the way, we have moments of victory and moments to celebrate, including June 15, 2012, which is when President Obama stood in the Rose Garden and announced that the Department of Homeland Security was going to be pursuing and creating the de this deferred action program that you've benefited from, that more than 660,000 others have benefited from. And I want to quote from his remarks in the Rose Garden that day. Valerie and I were there, standing in the colonnade, kind of lurking behind columns, watching this moment in history. I confess to uh, shedding a few tears as it was happening, and I know other, lots of other people were watching around the country and shedding tears as well. This is what he said. He said, put yourself in their shoes. Imagine you've done everything right in your entire life, studied hard, worked hard, maybe even graduated at the top of your class, only to suddenly face the threat of deportation to a country that you know nothing about, with a language that you may not even speak. It makes no sense to expel talented young people who, for all intents and purposes, are Americans. They've been raised as Americans, understand themselves to be part of this country, to expel these young people who want to staff our labs or start new businesses or defend our country simply because of the actions of their parents or because of the inaction of politicians. So last month we celebrated three years since the creation of the DACA program um, and the 660,000 plus individuals who have benefited um, and more who age in to eligibility every day. Um, at the same time that we celebrate that, we also have a battle in the courts uh, over what we think of as DACA Plus, the expansion of the DACA program, and DAPA. Um, and even as that fight continues, we also have to keep our eye on the ball of what happens in this town in the legislative debate that is still underway, a debate that we have to win and that your actions, our actions, determine, since it is not a question of if, it is a question of when. What we do determines when that day is going to come, when a comprehensive immigration reform that includes the DREAM Act gets signed into law. That's still the goal, and it's still the goal because of something else the President said on that day in the Rose Garden, and that is that you deserve better than to have to plan your life out in two-year increments for all of how incredibly important, right? <laughs> as incredibly important as DACA is, um, you have to renew it every couple of years. It's not a permanent solution. And a permanent solution to our immigration problems is on a path that goes directly through the Congress of the United States, and we can't lose sight of that. The President never does. He insists that his team never do. And that's really the work that Diane just laid out, that all of us have in front of us. But here's the other thing that I know. We can talk, and we do talk a very good game about the benefits of DACA, the benefits of comprehensive immigration reform. We can quantify, and in fact, the President's Council of Economic Advisors has quantified just exactly what it means to our economy to get these things right in terms of economic growth, in terms of advances in GDP, in terms of job creation, in terms of tax dollars. It's an excellent empirical case, and we make it all the time. But the best case still is your lives and your stories and the great contributions that you are already making uh, to this great country of ours. Um, that is still the most compelling story. And our job, um, our job is to make sure that we're helping you tell it, but it's ultimately yours to tell. And the, the reason that we have come as far as we have in the immigration debate is because of the courage and the fortitude of um, really brave people um, like all of you who stood up and said, here I am. And how can you think of me as anything other than American? Uh, and eventually the country will catch up to what we know. And the Congress, well, the country at some level has already caught up to what we know. It's the Congress of the United States that needs to catch up to what we know. And we're going to keep working until we make that happen. So thank you for what you do. Um, thank you for the inspiration that you bring to this debate, the inspiration that you bring to your students every day. Um, that gives us tremendous hope for the future. Um, together we're going to get this done, uh, and we're going to get it done because you were brave enough to tell your stories, and we will do everything we can to strengthen your voices and the contributions that you make to this debate and to this country. So thank you all very much for today and for the inspiration, and here's to the work ahead. Adelante.